Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Mays. I'm the student ministry director here. Um, I'm not the guy who preaches here all the time, so uh, if you don't like me, uh, just come back next week and hear Pastor Matt. So uh, don't, uh, don't judge character off of me of this church. Um, I'm going to do my best, though. Uh, okay, so first service, uh, they did a really poor job of interacting with me. So I'm hoping second service is better. Okay, so if you ate way too much food on Thanksgiving, just give me a big, uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Loosen out the belt, right? Put it on your stretchy pants. If you've ever had just one of those weeks, you know, families in town, craziness, some of you who made Thanksgiving dinner and it was just bananas, crazy, you have lack of sleep, just give me a big old, yup. Wow. Oh, so all of you have perfect lives, huh? All right. Well, see you later. Bye. Get out of here. No, I'm kidding. But I'm telling you what, you guys, I'm just being real, being honest with you. These past two to three weeks have been uh, a little rough for, for Mr. Connor here. Um, two weeks ago, I was in Tampa at the National Youth Workers Convention where th- over 3,000 youth pastors got together. And um, man, was it exhausting. Um, if you thought was exhausting. Just multiply me by 3,000. So yeah, it was a lot. Um, A lot of early mornings, late nights, walking around, heard some awesome speakers, you know, learned a lot of stuff. Um, But man, was it just exhausting. And to be honest, uh, a a time where I was supposed to be filled up, uh, I was just felt tired, felt more tired leaving. Um, And so I left from Tampa where the convention was, Um, And I flew to Philly, and I was going to Philly to BWI. And uh, so I make it to Philadelphia, nice and easy, nice ride, just kicking back, cooling, watching uh, Spider-Man Homecoming on my iPad. It was was easy, all right? So then I get to Philly, and uh, Philadelphia Airport's not my favorite. But still, you know, I had two hours there. I was like, dude, I've got this. Yeah, some of you are like, oh, I know it's coming. Uh, So I go grab a Philly cheesesteak, go sit down by my gate. I'm chilling. I'm cooling. Finishing up Spider-Man, okay? And it's around 8.50. My flight takes off at 9.05. And I am on the other side of the airport at gate F, where my ticket said be at gate 8F. Well, turns out my ticket was wrong. And it was on, the gate was B10, which is on the other side of the airport. So I have less than 10 minutes to get to the other side of the airport. Let's just say I got my steps in that day, okay? I was booking it. If you've ever, like, been late to uh, to your flight before and you're carrying those bags, you have to do that awkward run with all your bags. And I was, (laughs) the cheese was not a good idea. Oh, that got a little loud. Um... That it was, oh my gosh, it was awful. And I'm like, just, oh, you stupid ticket. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make sure somebody knows about this one. And I get there, and my flight's gone. And it's 9 o'clock in the evening. I've called everybody I can call. I'm two hours away. Looks like Connor's not making it home on time. And, uh, oh, by the way, this was Saturday, last Saturday. And uh, I had to be here for Sunday morning service. Uh, the next morning. So I ended up staying in a friend's. He was very gracious and, and loving and let me stay at his place and drove me the next morning. And I drove from BWI to here uh, last Sunday morning. And if you saw me, I was sitting in the back and I was kind of doing one of these. Barely got any sleep. It wasn't because Pastor Matt is, you know, a boring preacher or anything like that. No, I'm kidding. But I was exhausted and I was frustrated. And then it dawned on me oh my gosh, I agreed to bring my entire student ministry to come help with Operation Christmas Child to pack boxes, pick them up, and put them into trucks all day. Fun, right? I am on two hours of sleep. I'm already frustrated. Uh, I, you know, it's been a rough time. I just want to go home. I want to, I also haven't seen my wife in two weeks because she was gone the week before. So, huh, it was rough. But then we get, to, we get to Operation Christmas Child. The students come, and we're out in the lobby. We're packing these boxes. Um, and Operation Christmas Child is 
for uh, kids around the world where people come and bring these little toy boxes um, and they fill them with stuff uh, for kiddos around the world. And these are like the only gift that some of these kids get. Um, they go all over. And so we are a, like a drop-off location. And so we help pack the boxes or take the boxes from one big truck to the next big truck. So it's a lot of, of moving around and stuff like that. But that evening, I saw something that really just changed my perspective. I saw 25 teenage kids helping out, moving boxes, packing, taping them up, making these boxes, putting little boxes inside of boxes, having them take these giant boxes to the next and stacking them up, and not one complaint. And I was like, what in the world? And I'm sitting here in my head like, oh, this is stupid, you know, complaining like a little, little baby. And these kids are, like, they have homework to do. They just came up from practice. Uh, they have projects to do. Some of them were like, yeah, I came from another thing to help out at this church or this place, and I came here to help out here, and I can only be here for a little bit, but oh my gosh. And something dawned on me that, first of all, it was Connor, quit being baby, seriously. Like, stop being on your, your little pity party and stuff like that. The other thing I saw was this. There's something beautiful about people just showing up and being in person. And in fact, that's the series that we are starting today. Um, we're kicking off our series in person. And in fact, that is our theme for Susquehanna Valley Church this Christmas season. We've seen so many times, we've seen through scripture, we've seen through our personal lives, we've seen our church come together and be in person for somebody. And seeing that is one of the most beautiful gifts and most authentic things you can give as a gift, is being in person, whether that's helping somebody move or clean out a garage or just being there for somebody. Man, you, you can't write a check big enough that can replace that. And so that's why we uh, called this series In Person. And in fact, we see this in Jesus, especially when he came here on earth, when he was born. And so I would love to, to set it up for you, set, paint a picture for you of, of what this scene looked like. But before I do that, I need to get a prop. Um, and if you're watching this on video later on, sorry, I'm going to go out of the, the camera for a second. I got to grab something. I just want to make sure this is real life for you guys, okay? You know, um, you know, I was digging around, digging around, and I, I finally found something. Um, hopefully I don't knock this tree over. Somebody's going to be mad at me. All right. Uh, say hi to baby Jesus. Come on now, guys. Baby Jesus. All right. So I just wanted to make sure you guys had a clear picture. Can everybody see that? All right, good. So the manger scene, right? So first of all, we have to start it off with the travel, okay? Now, Mary and Joseph are called to, to travel. They need to go to their hometown because there's been a Roman decree about uh, making sure everybody's registered, that they know who they're ruling over. So they have to go to their hometown. So they're traveling south, and they are going mile, walking after walking. And there's no Uber. There's no plane. There's no nothing. This lady who is more than likely, like, eight to nine months pregnant and is walking miles with her husband. And man, I can't imagine how that trip went. Um, but they travel down and they, they get registered and everything. And then it's happening. How many of you have experienced that? Some of you parents experienced that, whether that was in the middle of the night or whatever, it's the baby's coming. Uh-oh. And that panic just, oh my. What do we do? And especially dad. Dad's probably freaking out. Like, oh my gosh, where do we go? Okay, let's try this in. Maybe they'll take us in here. Nope. Okay. Oh, what about over here? Wait, no. You don't have any room? Are you sure? No? Okay. Uh, come over here. Come into this manger. And I can guarantee you Mary's like, I'm not having a baby in a manger. Okay? Uh, that's nasty. Because we love to make this manger cute and nice. We have. I, I guarantee you most of you have little manger scene set up already. If you don't, you're slack and Christmas is coming, people. All right? So you have a little manger scene. It's all cute, baby Jesus, you know, and, and Mary's all, you know, probably got makeup on. She's all pretty and Joseph's just sitting over there like a proud dad. Uh-uh. 
no chance, <laughs> okay? It was dirty, it was nasty and filthy, okay? There were animals around them, and if any of you have grown up on a farm, you know animals are nasty. And, you know, as I'm prepping for this, all I can imagine is like a sheep in Mary's face as she's giving childbirth. She's ah, right in her face, just like, I'm like, oh my gosh. And so you guys know my wife is a labor and delivery nurse and studying to be a midwife. So I know way too much about this process, more than I would like to know. Um, and that area has to be clean. Like my wife would be like, ew, germs, infections, ew, this, that, and say big words like don't know. And then, and, and so, but this was dirty. But let's think about that for a second. They know who this baby is. This baby is the king of kings, the Messiah. Emmanuel is coming and he's being born in death. Come on, man. He should, he should be in a, you know, the cleanest, the nicest, the nicest treatment, right? No, we have better treatment than Jesus did. And so Jesus came from heaven, from his rightful throne, his righteous throne, where there's no pain and no suffering, and he's born in filth. Talk about step down. And so that's what we're talking about this morning. Being in person means a step down. And we have a perfect picture right here of what that looks like, of having to take a step down. And, and it just, it blows my mind. And I love, you know, digging deeper on the, the manger scene. And, and I remember last year sharing this with my students and they were like, what the heck, that is crazy. And, and I love it because it's a perfect picture of what humility is. It, it really takes a lot of humility to go from power to peasant. It takes a lot of humility to go from power to peasant. Has anybody seen the show uh, Undercover Bosses? I don't know if it's still on or anything like that. We had one hand. Okay. So I'm talking to one person. No, I'm kidding. But I've seen the commercials, and the idea of the show is this. The, a big CEO company, uh, of a company uh, goes undercover. They get makeup, and they put on the outfit and stuff like that so nobody knows who they are and they go to like the factory or the lowest of the low in the totem pole in their company that they own, right? It's to show multiple things. It's to humble the CEO. It's to show that the, um, to build a relationship with the CEO and the, the people lower on the totem pole and things like that. And it's just amazing because they, they grow in humility and you see towards the end of the show when they do this, man, they have a different perspective than when they started. You know, when I was thinking about this and I'm prepping for the message, I was like, you know, it's like going from, some of you are going to be really mad at me um, about this, but it's like going from like Folgers coffee to like, like any other coffee ever. You go from like really bad to like really good, you know, like you can't go back. Like I I'm not going back to Folgers Coffee. Sorry if I offend anybody. But there has been points in this church during the week where there's just Folgers Coffee. And I have to have a come to Jesus meeting with myself and say, man, you need caffeine. <laughs> just do it. It's, oh, it's like all cream actually, but that's beside the point. But it, it's so hard to go from something so wonderful to filth. To go from glory to the, the dirt, that takes a lot of humility. That takes a lot of us swallowing our pride and, and just diving in. I mean, Jesus suffered from the beginning. And if you look at his life, he didn't have this amazing life, a glorious life. From our perspective, at least, from a worldly perspective, he didn't. He was made fun of. He was argued with every time he opened his mouth, man. Could you imagine that every time you say something, someone's like, you're wrong. His, even his closest friends said that to him. And in fact, one of his closest friends betrayed him and he ended up on a cross with rusty nails in his hands. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a mournful life. That's the American dream right there, right? No. From the beginning, he struggled, and it did not stop. And in fact, it, it blows my mind because God is so powerful and so wonderful. And as I'm preparing for this message, uh, Pastor Matt and I are going back and forth, and he lays this scripture on me, and, and it kind of blew me away because if you think about how powerful God is, like he created you and I, created the depths of the ocean, all the creatures that live in this world, how powerful he is. And, and, and Isaiah 40, 10 through 11 says this, see the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He's powerful. But the very next verse says this, he tends to his flocks like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arm and carries them close to his heart. And he gently leads them, uh, those who have young. So he, he has this power, but he, he comes to us with gentleness and love. You know, when I was at that convention, you're around a lot of youth, youth workers at this convention, obviously. And if you've ever been in an environment where, you know, you're with like your people, whether you're a runner, whether you're a teacher and things like that, either you get gossip and complaining or you get the comparison game, right? So uh, how big's your church? Huh? Yeah, well, we got 3,000. Oh, real cool guy. How big's your youth group? You know, let's X them out. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we have 100. We have a full grown band. We have a full band and everything like that. Like that was the continuous thing. And it took so much out of me to say, yeah, well, you know, come back at them and say, these are all the good things I have and what my church is about. And you don't even do this. And you're probably just a phony and you're just a dummy head. Um, but I, want, I, I so wanted to not be humble in that moment. And it's really hard. But why is humility so hard? I think because we have a lot of interruptions in our life. We have a lot of things that interrupt it. Like one of the things I have found is uh, your everyday life interrupts humility. Especially if you're like a scheduled person, like you can't deviate from it. Man, there, there's no room for humility because I gotta get to this place and this place and I have to do this thing. I have to pick up the kids here and drop them off there and then I gotta pick them up later and then I gotta make dinner and I gotta... There, there's no room for me to, to step down and be humble in those moments because I got to get my stuff done. The other time I, I, I see it is, you know, it's, it is really hard to swallow that idea that you weren't humble beforehand. Okay, listen to this. A lot of the times I've, I've seen this a lot. Like you see it on social media, you see it on Sports Center, you see it wherever. Hashtag humble, right? Everybody wants to be known as humble. Everybody thinks they're humble, right? You see it all the time. I see bit, like, you know, big time business owners, hashtag humble, and then they get in their Lamborghini and grrr, drive off, right? Everybody, want, even if you're not a believer, even if you're not a Christian, you want to be humble. You want to be known as humble. I'm sure every time you went to a job interview, you're the fourth person to say, you know, I'm just really humble, right? But here's the reality is a lot of the times we are not. And it, it is really hard to admit that we weren't before because it says that we were living life wrong before. A lot of, a lot of us don't want to admit that. I'm, I'm just as guilty as that. A lot of us don't want to admit that we weren't being humble because it makes us look like a bad person. So we don't want to swallow that pill. The other thing I've seen is we always have somewhere else to be. I see this with my students a lot. You know, kids, they're busy, teenagers, you know, college applications, SATs, uh, sports, whatever it is, hanging out with friends. Even you guys, you know, parents, you're driving your kid all over the place, making sure that they have food, making sure that they, you know, stay alive. Um, that's kind of a big responsibility. You know, you're busy. But we're always looking towards the next thing. 
We're always looking towards the next thing. We're always on our calendar looking forward to what's going to happen. What are the plans later? What are we going to do after this? Are we getting food? That's my question. Um, Seriously, are we getting food after this, guys? Um, But we always are looking for that next thing. And and here's the, the greatest advice I've gotten in the past five years. Be where your feet are. Are your feet at work? Are your feet on the, the sports field? Are your feet at your friend's house? Are your feet at your in-laws? No, they're right here right now. So don't be focusing on what you're doing later. Be here. Be present. And I'm not blaming this on social media or anything like that. I think it's made it a little more difficult. But we've always, there's always been that guy that has something better to do, right? Right? They're always on their phone. They're always like, all right, when are we done here? I got to get out of here. And they're not present. It's really hard to be humble because we're on our high horse when we are always looking to do the next thing because it shows everybody else that you're not important enough for my intention right now. So those are a few things, but I want to ask you, man, what, was, what is your interruption? What gets in your way of you being humble? Because when we have these interruptions in our life, it keeps us from taking a step down in our life, just like Jesus did in his birth. Humil- the interruptions of humility keep us from taking a step down. And we all have things. All of us have legitimate things that interrupt our humility. But what we have to understand is the Bible's very clear on this, that we have to be able to examine ourselves, give ourselves a, a CAT scan, if you will. Um, we have to be able to look at ourselves and say, man, what are the things that I am struggling with right now? What am I not doing well? We have to be able to point those things out in our life. And if not, we have to have people in our lives to point those things out in us. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why we come together. That's why we do this on Sunday morning so that we can be reminded of, again, who we're living for, worship him, and to be reminded of the things that, man, the good things that we're doing and the things that we really need to work on. And that can be a really hard thing. And in fact, I had my students do this. This was awesome. Uh, My student leaders, uh, I have about five or six of them. We got together and I had them sit in a circle. They're They're all in high school. And I have them each pick one person in the group, say one good thing about them, and one thing they need to improve on. And man, they did not hesitate. They were cut throat. I'm telling you what, you want to find out your flaws, just go back to youth ministry. They'll tell you, especially if you're short like me, they'll remind you every day. Every day, they'll remind you. But we need to be able to have people in our lives that can point those things out in a loving way. We need to be able to share truth in grace because I've seen both sides. I've seen people who have way too much grace and they don't share the truth and people who are just way too truthful and no grace. We need to be able to have those people in our lives that can share that with us and say, dude, you're not being humble right now. It is so important for us as believers as we continue to grow as, as believers and grow in likeness of Christ to have that. But why should we put so much effort into it? Why does it matter? Why does it matter if we're humble or not? Why should we even try to take a step down? Because a step down is relatable. A step down is relatable. I love being a part of this church because a part of what we want to do is we want to impact the community around us. And uh, we want to make sure that people are loved who have not been loved. We want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to sit at the table with us and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so when I say step down is relatable, I say this uh, because uh, there's a lot of ground you can stand on when you can say, I've been where you've been, or I get it. Because if you've always been up here, you don't understand it down here. You don't know what it's like down here. And so, and none of us want to be talked down to or talked, you know, when, you, when you're talking to a kid, right, and a kid's acting nasty, some of you teachers know this. What do you do? Do you just say, stop it? No. 
right? You don't yell at them. You don't talk at them. You get down on one knee. You look them in the eye. And you talk to them. You ask them questions. You become relatable when you step down from your throne. Because it gives you ground to stand on. When you have that respect of that kid, man, you can, you can really shape that person to, to uh, understand what you're trying to teach them. You can, get, you can help them understand that, man, you're not being humble right now or that you're not living the right way. But if I just, like, I'm standing on the stage right now, of course I'm speaking about this, but if I just say, you're living your life wrong, you're living your life wrong, you're living your life wrong, you need to fix it, does that do anything? No. No, we need to take a step down and walk alongside one another just as Jesus came down to be with us so that he can say, I've been where you've been. I've suffered like you've suffered. I've been through the greatest pain. I've dealt with people betraying me. I've had people backstab me. I've had people spit in my face. I've experienced hunger. I've experienced loneliness. And I got through it. Because the crazy thing about Jesus is, and, and this, I've, I've read a bunch of, of studies and things like that, but the crazy things about, about Jesus that I found is this is that Jesus was fully human. Jesus was fully human. So when we read the Bible and we see that he had nails go through his hands, he had nails go through his hands. When he experienced hunger, he experienced hunger. He didn't just wave a wand or he didn't have a pill to just get him through it. He didn't use his almighty power to get him through it because he knew that step down was relatable and he had to go through it too. So now Jesus has all the credibility. Not if he, if, if, he already did have the credibility, but now he has even 10 times more because he can say, I've been where you've been. I've suffered like you suffered and we're going to get through this. A step down is relatable. But what I love even more about that is that Jesus gave you and I an opportunity to continue that ministry. What I love about Jesus is that he passed on this ministry to us. It's our turn now. It's our turn to step down. It's our turn to go and be on the same level as everybody else. It's our turn to share that love. And that's what I love, that that Jesus would would pick us. He would pick us to continue his ministry. But it takes us being willing to sacrifice and being willing to humble, be humble. And it's going to be really hard. Uh, when I was thinking about this and preparing for this message, I, the story of the rich man came right to my head. When, when Jesus was met face to face with this man, who all we know is he was the rich man, and if you read it, you see, uh, you read this genuine love and desire for Jesus. Um, this man is, not, how can I, how do I get into heaven? How do I, I, I followed your commandments. What else do I need to do? Like, he's not stopping. He's like, man, please tell me what I need to do because I want you. Jesus is like, you really want me? Go sell all of your stuff. All of the hard earned work that you humbly got, go sell it all. And at the end of, of this scripture, Jesus says this, and I assure you that everyone who, get, who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or property for my sake, for the good news, will receive now and return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Jesus in his birth gave us a picture of how to live our lives. It's not about attaining to get to the top. And I'm not saying don't work hard. And if you're there and you've done that, that's amazing. 
Praise God for that. But we should not be working to get ahead of everybody. Instead, we should be looking to step down and walk alongside everybody. And that is the picture that Jesus gave us in his birth. Last year at this time, um, so like I said, my, my wife's a labor and delivery nurse, so she works on holidays. And uh, we've been married for two years now, uh, a little over two years. And so I, uh, on our first Christmas, was alone. And some of you have experienced that. And if you've ever experienced loneliness on a day of celebration, you feel like this distance and you feel just miserable. And I've never felt so alone in a long, long time because this was our first Christmas. We were supposed to celebrate together. Now, second time around, second Christmas, last year, Christmas Eve, in this very room, I was mentally preparing, all right, what am I gonna do tomorrow? Probably play some video games, watch Netflix, you know, something to distract me. And somebody overheard me and my wife talking in this building, and they came up to me and said, do you wanna, do you wanna come to our Christmas? I was like, hold the phone, wait, what? And because I always thought, and maybe you did too, that Christmas was for family. Like there's other times when you can invite people over, but this is a time to see, you know, Aunt Margaret and Aunt Ruth and, and, and the distant cousins and things like that. This was our time. Nobody else, right? This is our time. And I was so touched that I was like, you, you want me in at Christmas? Like what happens 10 years from now when you are looking at the Christmas pictures, you see the weird guy in the back going, what, what's gonna happen that, like, they're like, we don't care, we want, like, you're gonna be alone, we want you at Christmas. And I cannot tell you how much that meant to me and how great that day was. I went over, they fed me, that I was first in line, which that was their first mistake, but, <laughs> but they loved me and they took a step down and I remember talking to the woman who owned the house and she was like, Connor, I was just praying, praying that somebody would come into our home. We would be able to invite them over for Christmas. She goes, honestly, I thought I was gonna be a homeless man, but you showed up. So I was like, same thing, right? <laughs> but what does that look like for you? What does a step down look like for you? Does it look like inviting somebody into your home? Does it look like forgiving somebody that you've held a grudge for for a very long time? Does it look like getting out of your comfort zone and praying with somebody out loud? Does it look like asking somebody, how are you doing and actually meaning it? Being prepared to hear the hardship that might come out of their mouths. What does a step down look like for every single one of us? Because I'm telling you right now, this is not gonna be easy. This is going to be hard. But you know why it's worth it? Why, why, why does it matter about being humble? Why does it matter about taking a step down? It's because of this. It's because the world is starving for us to step down. We have so many, so much fake in our world. We have clickbait of, uh, you know, articles of, of, People who, they're just trying to get you to click on their website. There's people who are trying to sell you stuff, whether it's a, a, an item or a lifestyle that is just not true. You have fake people, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. And to be honest, the church, the global church, has done a pretty poor job of that. So I want to be a part of a church, Susquehanna Valley Church, that takes a step down. Because the world is starving for it. They are hungry for it. In Isaiah 42, 6 through 7, this, this just blows my mind. Blows my mind. Isaiah 42, 6 through 7. I, the Lord, have called you right, in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be covenant people and a light to the Gentiles. 
to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. We have been called to be a people, to bring people out of darkness, to free the slave, to help the prostitute, to help out the widow, to help the people who don't have a family, to help out the people who are in need. We are called to be a light in this world, but it takes us to take a step down from our throne and step down, be with these people, walk beside them, love them, to share the greatest joy and love in the world, and that is Jesus Christ. But it's going to take us being humble and taking a step down. So my question to you is this, what's going to be your step down? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming to us in the dirt. Thank you for presenting yourself as a living sacrifice for us so that we know we can be confident in who we are and how we should live our lives. God, I thank you for everybody in this room right now. God, I know that there's a reason why everybody is in in this room right now. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the opportunity to, to share your gospel, to take a step down in our lives. God, I pray this Christmas season we would take a step forward and taking a step down, God. Thank you for your son, Jesus, coming in the most beautiful and humble way possible. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.